My name is Zach. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm here to tell you whether large-scale automated scanning is going to stop malware on open source software repositories. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, I saved you 40 minutes. You can go take a break before the next session. Um, uh, but so, so th this talk is based on some research work I've done, uh, and it's open access, so f you don't need to pay $50 to, to go read the PDF version. Uh, I'd encourage you to, to read it for a whole lot more detail than I'm going to have time to get into uh, now. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a pretty interesting look at software repository security uh, and how it shakes out actually in practice. Um, so who am I to be, be telling you about all this stuff? I'm a research scientist at a startup called ChainGuard. Uh, we work on software supply chain security, whatever that means. Uh, but that extends to include things like open source security of package repositories. Uh, so my academic background's in kind of applied cryptography, uh, but I'm interested in general in software repository security, package repository security, uh, especially package signing and provenance, but also things like two-factor auth and, uh, as you're going to see, um, you know, malware detection. I'm also interested in, you know, sort of policy for secure supply chain. That includes things like uh, government policy. It also includes things like machine-readable policies for how do I decide when I'm running some software where, whether I should trust it or not. Um, so we're going we're gonna to kick off with a, a little bit of background on malware detection. Um, so what do I mean by malware detection? As, as long as we've had malware, we've had scanners for malware. Uh, the first sort of computer worm was, was um, something called Creeper. It was at uh, BBN in the early days of, of networked computers. Uh, and it was just a little, little piece of software that duplicated itself. And if it was present on your machine, it would just print out this message, I'm the Creeper, catch me if you can. So very innocuous as far as malware goes. Um, but they realized at some point that this had gotten onto like every machine on their network uh, and uh, kept duplicating itself and was showing no signs of stopping and was starting to actually cause like disk usage issues. So uh, they made a new program called the Reaper, which just looked for the Creeper program uh, and deleted it. Um, and so this, this sort of, I think, uh, represents that, you know, one, if you've got computers, people are going to do uh, bad things with them, uh, whether, whether they mean, mean badly by it or not. And two, uh, it's actually pretty useful to be able to have software that can go look for the software doing the bad things and, and get rid of it or prevent it from, from entering in the first place. Um, so how does, how does malware detection actually work? Uh, there's, there's two main flavors. Uh, one is what you'd call signature-based. So this is what you think of when you think of like antivirus. It has a big, long block list of software. Uh, and the simplest possible way to do this is to just have a big list of hashes, uh, right? And it looks at a file and it says, this file belongs to this virus. Don't run it. Um, uh, but you can get a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, obviously, it's very easy to defeat, right? Uh, the malware can just change a byte at the end. That doesn't affect the operation of the code. And now it's got all of a sudden a brand new hash. Uh, so there's kind of an arms race in terms of uh, normalization that'll happen, and it'll try to, try to look up the hash. Uh, but, but all of the signature-based stuff, basically the way it works is I've seen evidence in the wild of this software behaving badly. Uh, this software looks like a very specific kind of malware that I've seen before in the past, so I'm going to flag it as malware. Uh, the other, so it doesn't at all generalize to new samples, right? Uh, it doesn't, you know, like it's never going to work against sort of like the first instance of a piece of malware that you see. In contrast, behavior or anomaly based, these are the same things that are used kind of interchangeably. Uh, try to figure out what the software does. So these, these malware detection uh, methods do generalize to new pieces of malware. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to actually run the software and watch, wait for it to do something bad, like send a credit card number to some foreign server. Uh, it, it can, right? You can sort of do runtime monitoring. You can also run things in sandboxes. Uh, you can also do static analysis and just look at the file itself uh, or the source itself. Um, and so. Uh, for the most part, we're going to be talking about the latter category today, uh, just because uh, while signature-based malware detection does have a lot of uses uh, in the package repository setting, we're really concerned about, you know, not exact copies of malware that we've seen before, uh, but, but sort of new malware that's, that's coming onto a package repository. 
Um, and so these are, these are kind of the flavors of behavior-based malware detection. There's the static analysis, uh, which looks at the software. And so like, if you're in Python, you can look for things like um, you know, eval of base64 of some block of data, right? And that's, that's very suspicious. It's very rare that you would do that in normal, genuine code, unless you were trying to obfuscate or hide what you were doing. Um, you can look for things um, not to not to pick on Russia, uh, but like URLs in your software library that end in .ru or in a binary, right? You can just run strings on that and, and look for .ru. Uh, it looks for execution of code that's remote uh, loaded remotely, all all sorts of stuff. And the heuristics can range from like very very simple to very very complicated that try to like parse the AST of the program or decompile something and figure out what it does. Um, the static analysis, I would say, is in general, uh, because you don't have to do that decompilation step, much easier to do in interpreted languages. So we're going to talk a lot today about how this works in Python. Um, it can definitely miss things. Um, the, the sort of flip side of that is dynamic analysis. So this is where you actually are running the software and seeing what it does. Uh, this is obviously a little dangerous, right? If you're running a potentially malicious piece of code, uh, it could do malicious things. Uh, so in general, you want to be doing this in kind of a sandboxed environment. Um, it can also miss things. And in particular, dynamic analysis can be detected by malware, right? Uh, it's very easy to do something different when you notice you're running in a sandbox than what you would do under normal circumstances. So you can have a flag that says, you know, if it looks like I'm being scanned by a malware detector, don't be evil, otherwise be evil. Uh, and here's a, a cartoon of the I don't know if you remember this, this Volkswagen's emission test scandal a couple of years ago, but that's exactly what they did. They, they had a, the car figure out when it was being emissions tested, and when it was, it emitted less stuff. Um, so how does all of this stuff work? Uh, there's a pretty rich uh, academic literature uh, on malware, malware detection. As you can see, there's like hundreds of thousands of academic papers on it. Uh, and techniques that get used range from regular expressions to looking for patterns in the abstra abstract syntax tree of the software. They decompile things, they sandbox, uh, they have antiviruses, which are more often like these signature-based methods, which do hash or file-based matching. Um, as part of that, do, they, do, they often do normalization of the software that they're checking. Uh, you can look at metadata about the software, file names, where did it come from, is there a signature on it, uh, who is that signature from? Uh, and then I'm just gonna gonna hand wave over like deep learning and AI. Uh, but there are a number of methods that are sort of you know throw a neural net at a piece of software and see if that neural net says it's it's good or bad. Um, and then obviously you can combine these in arbitrary ways. Cool. So that's that's what malware scanning tends to look like. Uh, what's a package repository or what's a what's an open source software repository? Uh, so these are kind of usually tied to operating system or language ecosystems. Uh, so you can think, have things like apt or homebrew or portage. Uh, in some sense, you can consider like the Apple App Store or the, uh, the Google Play Store to be a package repository as well, though that's not the focus of our talk today. Um, there's language ecosystem um, repositories like PyPI, which is going to be something we're talking a lot uh, about today. Uh, there are things like NPM. Uh, you, can, you can go... Um, and then there's things that are in between. So Conda is a repository that is uh, focused on sort of data science and machine learning applications. Uh, so it's mostly Python, but it will blend, it'll install stuff from Fortran all the way to, you know, like CUDA code to what, whatever it needs to. Uh, there are things like Nix, which, which will install, again, pretty much anything. Uh, so there's, there's all sorts of, of these things. And I'm being a little bit sloppy here. Uh, if I'm being precise, we should be distinguishing between package managers, which are sort of the thing that you're running on your machine to install the software, and the repositories, which is the remote service where the software itself is living. Uh, and so when we're talking about malware scanning, we're usually talking about doing that on the repository itself, either to detect malware that's been uploaded after the fact, or to prevent malware from even winding up there in, in the first place. Um, and one big distinction we're going to make is between sort of curated and community-based repositories. Uh, so a curated repository, and so something like uh, you know, the, the Debian uh, apt repository, uh, will have a small number of trusted maintainers. Uh, so these are often like uh, you know, members of an organization, employees of a company. Um, and so uh, often your threat model says, 
let's really, really hope that none of the people with access to published packages to the app repository are evil. Um, and if they are, you know, we're, we're kind of in a bunch of trouble anyway, and so malware scanning is, is not necessarily the solution here. Uh, community repositories, in contrast, allow, you know, quote unquote, anybody to submit. So if, if I wanted, I could um, close this tab, open a new one, make a new account on PyPI and have software uploaded inside of, you know, I don't know, 10 minutes for my like hello world Python package. Uh, and that's really actually great, right? Like we're all at the open source summit because we think open source is great. Uh, democratic software development is awesome. We, everybody gains when sort of we, we have this big software commons that everyone contributes to. Uh, but it does come with risks, uh, right? And in particular, we've seen a number of instances where there are uh, malicious packages on these software repositories. Um, and and I, I, I could have kept going, but I was starting to run out of room on the slide. There's, there's all sorts of attacks uh, that, that you see. Um, and if anyone's curious, uh, come up after, after the talk, and I can point you at a cool data set that sort of just lists uh, compromise after compromise after compromise, or at least attempt at, at compromise, attack after attack after attack on these kinds of settings. Um, so uh, it's, it's at this point uh, that folks who, who um, you know, sit at home and comment on uh, websites with, with orange banners tend to ask questions like, why don't we just scan for malware? Uh, this will solve all the problems. There's this rich literature on malware detection. And so obviously if we do that, we can just you know, have, have a little program that says, you know, if is malware, don't let people upload it, and problem solved, um, right? And so, so we actually started uh, this project, and we thought, yeah, like, we hear people say this all the time. No one's really doing this in practice. What's the reason for that disconnect? And our assumption is, you know, the people who run these repositories are, are pretty smart and pretty dedicated to maintaining the security of these repositories. Uh, so if they're not doing it, there's probably a good reason. And maybe the reason is just the gap between, you know, kind of the performance that we see and the, the sort of needs that we have. So let's, let's go off and let's you know, download a bunch of these things and, and benchmark them and see how, how well they do. And, and then that's, that's the project. Uh, but at some point, we, we decided to stop before we just you know, collected some data and went to these repository operators and said, hey, like we know better than you about how you should be running these things, uh, right? And so uh, in, instead, we decided before we sit down and try to like benchmark, we need to know what we're looking for, uh, what sort of properties. Like, are we uh, going to, you know, like, what are the compute resources available? Is it okay if we come up with a good malware detector that takes, you know, hours and hours and hours to run on every individual package? Uh, are we okay with missing malware occasionally? Are we okay with flagging things that are good as malware occasionally. And these, these are the sort of questions that I, I would rather answer ahead of time than sort of after the fact, after we've gone through a lot of work to, to make the case for why we should or shouldn't be doing this. Um, yeah, um, so this, this slide is basically what I, what I was just saying. Um, in general, I, I, I like to know what I'm looking for before I collect a bunch of data, and that's, that's exactly uh, what we did here. Um, and in fact, we weren't the first people to ever propose doing this, and we weren't even the first people to like go out of our way to like try to put this in place on a repository. And in particular, on PyPI, so the Python package index, uh, which is run by the Python Packaging Authority, which is part of the Python Software Foundation, uh, in around 2019, uh, they sort of started putting together the groundwork for a big project uh, that you know, did uh, automated detection of malware. And so this got merged, you can see on the left, in February 2020. Um, and then in May of this year, um, it got removed, right? And so like, what's, what's the reason for that, that journey? Um, and so we wanted to start with, with sort of um, you know, so-called user research on PyPI, right? Like, can I just like, sit down and talk to people who are involved with this and say, what were you trying to accomplish? Like, what, why is this something that never wound up really getting turned on in prod, uh, and why did it ultimately get removed? And then I also wanted to talk to someone who was an academic who spent their time working on sort of the malware detectors and say, what are you trying to build, and what are you trying to look for when, when you're building these tools in order to make them useful in such a context? Um, 
And this is going to let us identify sort of the requirements uh, that we have when we're deploying these things. Uh, and then as part of this, we can identify other priorities, right? I don't want to come in and say, hey, automated malware detection is the solution to all your problems when maybe, you know, there's a bad password policy and everyone's password has, you know, three characters in it. Or, like, like what, what are the security priorities that you as an administrator of PyPI are dealing with and where does malware detection fall in that list? Um, so, what did, we, what did we actually find? And the, the first thing that's kind of an interesting point is, like, does malware on these repositories actually matter? Uh, and I'm picking a little bit on, on Phylum here, which is uh, a company that does security research. And to be clear, I think this is good and important research, and I'm glad that they're going out of their way to find, you know, attacks on PyPI. Uh, but, you know, they, they made this flashy blog post, and they say, oh, like, we found an ongoing attack. Someone's uploading malware to PyPI, and you're all going to get hacked. And then if you look at the names of the packages that they're uploading, it's like, you know, lib info hacked. Like, if, I, if you pip install that, you kind of deserve what's coming to you, you know? Um, and in general, I think malware is, is sort of a relative concept, right? Like, if you think about penetration testing tools, um, some, they do things that look a lot like what malware would do. So is that bad? Well, it depends on your context, and it depends on your expectations as a user. And so, like, I don't, in fact, think that there is one judgment that, like, even a human who sat down and studied this for years could make that says, this software is definitely good, or this software is definitely bad, right? There is no such thing. It's all, it's all relative. Um, furthermore, for malware to affect someone, it needs to actually get run, right? And, and there's, there's kind of, right, the saying, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Um, physicists tell me that the answer is yes, but the point of this parable is we don't care, right? And, and I feel the same way about malware. If someone's going to upload some malware to PyPI and then no one downloads it and no one runs it, it's not a big deal. Um, and in fact, most packages on PyPI, right, it's one of these things that follows a power law distribution where there's a handful of packages that pretty much everyone downloads. Uh, you know, really, really popular things like request, uh, async IO, and, and so on. Um, and then there's this big long tail. So PyPI has about half a million packages on it right, right now. Um, there's this big long tail of packages that got one release, got downloaded maybe once, probably by the author of the package, uh, and then never again. Um, and PyPI is actually really awesome in that they commit to making a lot of data open source uh, and available freely. So they have a big data set uh, that you can query about downloads of different packages, and you can see what are the statistics. And every package does get some downloads, but we think, and, and this is, this is kind of confirmed by talking to these administrators, we think that the bulk of these downloads for most packages are coming from like mirrors that are just scraping the whole thing. So every time something gets published, you know, if I have a mirror and I'm collecting uh, to you know host internally at my organization or for research purposes, I'll just download that right away. Um, and so we do see downloads of every pa uh, Python package, but we're still pretty sure that most packages, no one ever runs them. So all things equal, right? Like we'd prefer to remove these things. If something is just going to be a piece of software where when you run it, it scans your hard disk for things that look like credit card numbers and ship them off to some, some remote server, we don't need to be hosting that on PyPI and we'd like to get rid of it. But we care much more about specific cases of, of uh, malware. And so one of these is typo squatting, right? Does the package have a name that someone would plausibly install by, by accident, right? And so this could be, you know, uh, requests is a popular package. And maybe if you say requests with two S's or something, uh, someone's gonna, gonna try to grab that package name and, and it'll get installed by accident. Um, there's a, you also worry about compromises of existing packages. If someone takes over, uh, you know, they, they hack the account of someone who publishes one of these really, really popular packages. We worry a lot about malware there, too. But again, something like uh, self-hacked CV NVIDIA, like, eh, maybe, maybe that's not quite, quite as big a deal. Um, the other thing we found in, in talking to them is that there are different constraints than you might think. So one thing that I was worrying about when I was saying, oh, what if PyPI is going to run 
run these malware detection scripts. What if they what if they take like four minutes to run? Like that feels like a lot of compute, a lot of you know dollars to burn on AWS or whatever. It turns out most of these repositories don't really care uh, because as open source projects, while they may be incredibly understaffed, uh, they don't suffer for want of cloud resources. Uh, it's the easiest thing in the world for these you know, sort of cloud providers to say, we're not going to give you any, any volunteer time to help make the repository better, but we can throw some credits your way. And so if, if Py, PyPI comes along and says, hey, we're very desperate and we need to run these malware scanners, um, pretty easy for GCP, AWS, Azure uh, to say, sure, like have some credits with which to do that. So we're not actually that constrained on compute. I mean, to, to a point, right? If you, we were running some like fancy deep learning thing, like uh, you hear about these, these LLMs that cost, you know, $14 in compute per query or whatever. Um, that's probably not going to fly, but like something, you know, that, that's even pretty computationally intensive isn't actually a huge deal. Um, the latency is also a little bit flexible. And what I mean by that is if you're going to block publication of a package, you have at most a second or, or so, right? Like um, if when I try to you know, type npm publish, if that goes through a malware scanner before it's actually available on npm, the expectation is that I'll be able to download it pretty much immediately after publication. And this is just what, what users have come to expect. Uh, I've wound up, you know, you wind up in a situation where you're trying to redeploy something and the thing you're redeploying pulls from, from PyPI or NPM and like you're making an emergency fix. You want that, you want to be able to turn that around pretty quick and not, not see something like, oh, your package has been held. You know, it's going to be another couple hours until someone can manually review it, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that feels like in general a non-starter. But if we can say we're not so concerned about preventing these things from winding up there in the first place. We just really want to catch them uh, after the fact or, or, you know, pretty soon. Eh, no big deal. It's okay if the latency is a little bit longer. Um, but engineering resources are quite limited, uh, right? If, if you say, hey, like, we have something for you to, to implement, all you have to do is, like, read this academic paper and, like, transcribe this awful pseudocode algorithm into a real programming language and debug and, you know, put tests in for that and then deploy it and, right, like, that, that's actually a problem. So anything that we want to roll out has to be pretty simple. Uh, and also there are limited admin resources. So the admins on these, on these uh, repositories tend to be quite technical, uh, but they have, they have pretty limited time. And in particular, PyPI is... Uh, you know, quote unquote volunteer run. Uh, so most people who are who are admins on PyPI, it's not their day job. They you know have something else that they're paid to do, and something else that they're supposed to be doing during you know kind of business hours. And if a report comes in and needs to be dealt with on an emergency, some of them are in positions where they can you know take 20 minutes during the day to go deal with that. Uh, but others kind of have to wait for five o'clock and quit in time before they're able to do that. And so uh, in particular, what this means is that false positives when the uh, like a proposed malware scanner is says looks at some legitimate software and says hey this is suspicious why don't you the human review it uh, that's that's kind of an issue and and so uh, right like i can i can write you on the right there's there's my malware scanner that has no false negatives right it's going to catch every piece of malware um, and uh, the problem with this of course is that it causes a lot of a lot of noise and so when you're thinking about false positives, you want to you wanna think about like the base rate. And so what do I mean by that? Every year, there's about a million package updates that happen on PyPI. Uh, so you know, there's half a million packages, but most packages get updates, new versions, and so on. And each one of these is something that we're going to want to scan for malware. Um, there's uh, about... 10,000 packages that get removed from the by the administrators every year. Um, some of these are malware. Actually, a lot of them wind up being like spam uh, and things that are like not going to cause any problems, but are just like the full upload of a feature film, but they put it in you know .dot wheel format for some reason. Uh, th like if if you look at if you look at the like newly published packages on PyPI, this is actually quite common. Like the, I don't really know why, other than I guess it's like free hosting um, for for yeah. So um, if I assume an unrealistically good malware detector, and I, I assure you that this is unrealistically good, and we'll, we'll go into kind of some benchmarks to compare it with uh, soon. 
where it has 100% sensitivity, so it finds every you know, package that we want to take down, and it's got you know, kind of 1% specificity, which means that only one out of every 100 good packages are going to get flagged. So these are really, really good numbers uh, compared to what we see in the literature. Uh, most of the reports are going to be false positives, right? And that's maybe a little bit counterintuitive. You say, oh, it catches everything bad and only 1% of things good. But you have to realize there are many more good packages than the bad ones. So we wind up basically at this point with a majority of reports being false positives, which means a lot of wasted admin time. Um, and the worst part of this is the things that are most likely to get reported as false positives got reported because of some heuristic, which means that there is some ambiguity as to whether they're good or bad. It's not the cases that someone can look at and say immediately, oh, that looks like malware, that looks legitimate. It's, it's the sort of edge cases that uh, humans are going to wind up having to spend all their time on. Um, and this is the big reason why these malware checks that used to run in PyPI uh, got removed, is, is they were creating far too much noise and far too many false positives. Uh, the other really, really interesting thing that I learned is there is a malware detection system in place. In automate, uh, it just involves humans. It's not fully automated. Um, and so in this system, what happens is independent researchers uh, will like, run their own tools, and there will be a bunch of false positives. And then the human who ran the, ran the tool will go ahead and look and, and sort of uh, check those and make sure that there are no false positives. They'll filter those out, and then they just email the PyPI admins, and the PyPI admins you know, do a quick confirmation to make sure they're not taking down something legitimate, and then, and then they get taken, taken down. And this is kind of surprising that this is the solution that's emerged, because it's not like these researchers are employed by the Python Software Foundation or anything. Uh, but it turns out they get something out of it, which is, I guess, fame and glory in a very uh, limited, nerdy, nerdy sense. Um, and so, like, for instance, that, that blog post that I, that I linked or showed a picture of earlier from Phylum is one instance of this. Uh, security companies often really like to say, hey, we found all this malware. We're keeping you safe by our products. And it seems like actually a worthwhile investment for them. Uh, but it's great because then the PSF doesn't have to employ you know, teams and teams and teams of vulnerability researchers to do this. And they don't have to employ tons and tons of admins to like, scan through false positive flags all day. Uh, and these researchers now are really incentivized to have good tools that they keep updating because malware authors are pretty crafty. And if, if you knew the total set of automated malware checks that were going to run on PyPI, it's a pretty simple matter to go run those yourself against your packages before you try to upload them and, 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 and snare people. And you can do things like keep the checks secret, but that feels very contrary to the, sort of the open spirit of open source that, that we work in. So with that out of the way, uh, I'm going to spend relatively little time on the, the sort of quote unquote meat of this, just because I think, as you've seen, it's a lot less interesting now that we know what we're actually looking for. Uh, but uh, we did do some benchmarking, and, and it's, it's, I think, at least instructive to consider the gap between where we're at and what we need. So what do we use as a data set? Um, there's, there's a couple of previous projects that collect malware that has been on open source repositories. Uh, so one's called MalOSS, one's called the Backstabber's Knife, Knife Collection. Uh, and these are, these are sort of previous academic works where they, they went and they collected from various package repositories, oh, this is a bunch of malware. And so you cannot go just download this um, because you know, it would make it a little bit too easy for someone uh, with malicious intent to have a big repository of bad things to pull from and re-upload. Um, but it is available on request, and so if you can just say, hey, I am so-and-so, I have a research interest in this, in this problem, uh, they'll, they'll go ahead and send it to you. Um, and then we needed a data set of goodware, which is, um, you know, non-malicious packages. Uh, and actually, it's pretty easy to do this. The data set of goodware is just the packages that are on PyPI, uh, right? Because we assume that uh, things haven't been taken down. In theory, right, there could be things that aren't uh, detected, uh, but those are the things that no existing malware tools have caught. So our tools are obviously not going to catch those. So, like, there is sort of this sort of upper bounds how many of the bad packages we know we're catching, right? But, but, um, 
it's better to be able to catch some than none at all. Um, so we just took kind of a random set of packages. We took a set of popular packages because uh, there are, again, you know, half million of these things, and actually these malware scanners tend to take quite a while to run, so we only grabbed a 1,000 or so uh, to make it kind of computationally tractable. Uh, and then we deduplicated the set. Um, okay, and so what, what tools did we use? Uh, we started thinking we were going to have like a dozen of these things that we were, we were going to run, uh, but it turns out we had, you know, kind of three... Uh, requirements. Uh, one is that, you know, the source is available. And so actually a lot of these like proprietary tools uh, that um, companies offer because they're proprietary, the source is not available. So we can't run them ourselves. Uh, we were also looking more for anomaly based detection, uh, which actually most everyone does. Um, and then finally, there's a actually really important point. A lot of malware detection tools are kind of like engines. And they say, we're going to provide you a system that looks at a source file and runs a regex on it and then reports if that regex matches or not. Um, or we're going to you know, parse a Python AST and we're going to let you make some query about what you know, does it contain code in this structure, a function call with this name or, or whatever. Um, which is great, and it's a great start, but that actually doesn't let you detect malware. The kind of meat of that is what you'd call a detection rule, which is like the regular expression itself, or the like AST query itself, which you know says, oh, I'm looking for a val of base 64 of something. Um, and a lot of, a lot of these uh, analysis tools don't make their detection rules available, which makes it actually very hard to benchmark them. We could write our own, obviously, but then what we'd be benchmarking is not the engine, it's sort of, the bad rules that I just came up with. So uh, we, we kind of uh, narrowed down to, to three of these tools. Uh, there's the checks that actually ran on PyPI, or were supposed to run on PyPI, but never got, got actually deployed. Uh, there's a tool called OSS Detect Backdoor, and there's a tool called Bandit Formal. Um, and so, OK, what's, what's our setup? We, we're going to take our packages. Uh, we're going to get you know, kind of our data set. We're going to get the latest releases of each of these things. Uh, and we're going to run our tool and then count the alerts. Um, and so what did we find? We found that these are the packages with at least one alert when we ran the scanners on them. Uh, so, okay, if you look, so we ran, we, we ran in two settings. One is we just ran on the setup.py file, which is sort of things that can compromise you at install time, right? When you, when you install a Python package, um, we didn't know better than to, to let the package that you install run arbitrary code. Um, a, lot of, a lot of newer packaging systems say things like, OK, cool, we are just going to, when we install a package, put things in place. But, but Python lets you run whatever you want, including network access, including remote execution, whatever. Um, and so if, if you look, OK, we're finding, we're finding most of the malicious packages, which sounds pretty good, right? It's, it's a majority in, in pretty much every case. But then you look, we're also finding a majority of benign packages <laughs> too, right? Uh, and, and so like, I'll, I'll draw your attention in particular to the PyPI checks that were proposed. Um, if you just look at the popular packages and you scan all the files, not just the setup.py files, that's 94% of packages got flagged as potentially malicious, which I'll point out is higher than uh, if you actually looked at the malicious packages, uh, <laughs> right? OK, and so maybe we're not being fair, right? These tools aren't issuing verdicts. They're just issuing alerts, right? They're saying, hey, we noticed something matching this pattern. And the, the table I just showed you were packages where at least one alert fired. Uh, and so alerts can be innocuous. Um, and maybe you need to, you know, um, only certain combinations of alerts are things that we should worry about. And so you could imagine coming up with something, something really sophisticated for looking at sets of alerts uh, and turning that into a binary good or bad uh, analysis. We didn't want to do that. Um, uh, so instead we just said, well, what, what if we like, thresholded the like, quantity of alerts? And again, like these are the things that you would need to have in place for these to be deployable. You can't just hand like a regex matching engine to PyPI and say, hey, if you wrote really good regexes to look for malware, uh, you'd be able to find it. <laughs> 
right? Like, uh, so, so, okay, so you, you need to actually have a prescription here. And so we, we looked at kind of, of setting various thresholds. Uh, and so these, these are charts that show, you know, kind of, oh, what happens if we say, at, you know, that, that first table was at least one alert. This is what happens if we go one, two, three, four, five. Um, and what you wind up seeing is that as the threshold of alerts goes up, uh, the fraction, you know, the number of false positives go, goes down, but so do the number of true positives, right? And, and, you know, again, pretty soon you're catching so few, and often, uh, like if you look at this, uh, this uh, chart D, you'll find that the number of true positives goes down substantially faster than the number of false positives, right? And, and pretty soon, like, we, we can no longer distinguish between the, the true and, or the malicious and the benign packages. And also, I'll point out in general that people really love to throw, like, scores at things for scanning malware. Uh, but the score of actual malware just needs to be anything non-zero, right? Like, it just takes one line of code to turn a package that's like totally innocuous into something that does something evil. Um, and, and so I don't really love this idea of thresholds, but we, we figured we'd, we'd give it a shot. So th those were kind of our, our empirical results. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper, again, I'll, I'll refer you back to the paper, or I can take questions in a second. Um, but yeah, so, so just wrapping up, we're a long way away from having in-the-loop automated malware detection. Uh, other security measures should probably take precedence. And in fact, if you look at uh, the, the PSF blog and the work that PyPI is doing, they are. Uh, PyPI rolled out uh, two-factor auth requirement recently and is, is sort of ramping that up. Uh, and um, for the malware case in particular, a like, pretty reasonable alternative that, that requires some you know, manual work has evolved. Uh, it could be better, and there's a lot of places for it to be better, but it's not necessarily in the tooling. And I didn't get into it so much, but like, the, wor the worry is not that the malware detection tools that the independent researchers are doing aren't good enough. There's plenty of people working on that problem. The worry is that the interface that the admins have to deal with when they're taking down packages, right now they, you, they often have to like download the package, uh, you know, un, unzip the, the wheel or whatever, whatever the format is, uh, inspect the files themselves on the, in the console and like kind of look at what's been reported. You know, you could, you could imagine sort of a better, you know, web application that kind of exposes, hey, a researcher flagged it, here's the line of code that they're pointing to at evidence, like, you know, almost like a, a dating app interface on your phone, like swipe left, swipe right. Uh, and, there's, and there's a bunch of stuff. And again, if you just talk to the, the Python folks, uh, they, they will tell you, and they maintain actually a really great list of, they call it like fundables.markdown, uh, which is just things that they really want done, but they don't have the time to do themselves, that they've identified as high impact security improvements. Um, and that's a really great way to, uh, you know, listen to the folks who are like actually on the ground before they, you know, hang out in their ivory tower and do their research and, and try to impose a solution on them. Uh, and I will say, if you are a researcher, this is a really great opportunity because it makes writing the introduction of your paper really easy to say, hey, we, we actually, instead of, instead of trying to like justify this convoluted thing that we did, we solved a real problem and here's really good hard evidence as to why the work that we're doing is impactful. Um, and then I'll also uh, give a shout out to the Open SSF, uh, so which is part of the, the LF. Uh, they had a whole day of talks on Monday, which I assume will be available online pretty soon. Um, and the OpenSSF runs a Securing Software Repositories Working Group, which is really great uh, because it brings together folks who work on these package repositories uh, and folks from industry and uh, researchers as well. And it helps coordinate and sort of fund cross-cutting efforts. Because you'll notice a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that I was mentioning as being actually effective. You know, two-factor auth. None of that is super unique to Python itself. None of that is super unique to NPM itself, right? Like, and they can all benefit from implementing a lot of the same tools and solutions. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the talk. Happy to take any questions. <laughs> Billy? Y 
Yes, so that's a, that's a great question. So some of these tools, the alerts do come with severities. Uh, and we looked at like different decision rules. And then we thought about like, oh, should we like try to have some some you know statistical algorithm learn a decision rule? And then we got kind of like three steps into that and realized that uh, at that point we weren't evaluating existing tools; we were making our own new tool. Uh, and and so again, I think that that points to a need uh, for uh, if you're trying to design one of these tools for it to actually. You know, it's fine to sort of make that granular alert level information. Oh, we noticed this. It's a severe, you know, level alert. Oh, we noticed this. It's just a little suspicious. Making make that information available so that if a human's going to go review it after the fact, they have that available to them to make a decision. Uh, but you also really need to make a like binary, like good or bad verdict available. And that can even be tunable, right? Like you can say, like, oh, I don't know what your data set looks like. You're going to need to mess with, you know, this parameter. Uh, so maybe that's like the threshold, or maybe that's something else. Um, but but uh, I think that's the job of people proposing these tools, um, which is, I guess, my cop out way of saying I didn't want to do all the work of trying to figure it out. Uh, but it did it did feel like at that point we weren't evaluating the tools. We were sort of evaluating our own new tool that we were we were making up on the fly. Um. All right. I'm not trying to keep anyone here, so we can we can just call it. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs>